All right, so I'm going to first open with a prayer, all right? So let's bow our hearts and our heads. Father God, I thank you for that. We're two or more gathered together in your name. You are in the midst of us, Father, by spirit. The spirit of Christ dwells in us, uh, and we're born of the spirit. And Father, the spirit of truth will then open our eyes to this word, Lord, so that we can see things in the spirit that we cannot see in the natural. That's what Jesus said. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Father, so open our eyes, bring this word to life, Lord, sow it down in our hearts as a living seed to change us into your likeness. That's the way you do things. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Now, words, words. The uh, Bible says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. So God, everything God does is by words. All right. Now, there's a, a technique in teaching, I guess, or learning or whatever, is to compare and contrast, okay? Like, you know, up is the opposite of down, uh, heavy is the opposite of light, you know, whatever. But uh, in talking about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil or Lucifer, I, I'm going to kind of focus on comparing and contrasting so that, uh, that at least that, that's very useful in trying to understand than just kind of focusing on one topic, okay? Um, and uh, anyway, the more I was kind of doing this, I thought, wow, you know. But God it, it creates everything. Everything is, you know, of course, by, for, and through Christ. And it was God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's where we get confused sometimes because in the Old Testament, every single act of deity is said to be by God, Yahweh, okay? But you look in the New Testament and the exact same acts of deity Every single one of them are said to be, you know, done by, for, and through Christ. So it kind of looks like a contradiction, but it's not, okay? Because, it, you know, everything is conceived by the Father, performed through the Son, through the power and the agency of the Holy Spirit. All right? And that's, that's the way it works. And when, just as Jesus was both Son of Man and Son of God and operated in both realms, the same is true for us. Once, you know, we're born Son of Man, descended from Adam. Adam means man, mankind. You know, but when we're born a second time, we get something called a new heart, okay? And that new heart, um, which when Paul, Paul said, I wasn't taught the gospel by man, nor did I receive it from any man. I received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. It just came out of poof, thin air, okay? Um, actually, thin Holy Spirit, I guess, but, you know, but uh, in other words, he didn't go study real hard and figure it out. Ultimately, Absolutely everything in the Christian walk and faith must come by revelation. You know, just like Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not show that to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. Okay? So, uh, and, and so all salvation, every single thing, the power to say no to sin and everything is by grace, by the power of God as we submit to him. Does that make sense? Okay? But, you know, it, it, this is the, the Bible is the owner's manual, in a sense, for um, us, all right, uh, when he creates mankind. And it's, you know, the whole plan is to make us in God's image, all right? And, uh, and that, so that work is in progress. And once again, the Word is the creative part of that. You know, uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and glory. And well, that's Jesus, you know. But see, the same Word changes us into His likeness, and in, you know, which is the Father's likeness. Does it make sense? Because everything God does is by His Word. But it has to be fulfilled or empowered by the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's now do the contrasting part. Everything the devil does is by words. And his words also are anointed to produce the damage, the, the sin, the death, okay, that he wants to cause. So what God is the one that created the laws, okay? But see, devil, the devil takes what God has done and twists it and turns it upside down and backwards and uses the law to accomplish what he wants. All right? Does that make sense? So he went into the Garden of Eden with nothing more than words and caused the fall of all mankind. His, he's a liar, the father of lies. And of course, God had always tests our hearts, okay? Because we're supposed to make a choice who we're going to serve, 
okay? And so um, he said, don't eat of this tree of death over here. Well, the devil comes in and says, man, look at that thing. Boy, that fruit sure looks good, you know? And God had said, if you eat it, you're gonna die. Now he's talking about a spiritual death, all right? Not a physical death, but the spiritual death eventually eventuates or eventually becomes physical death, okay? And because it's a seed, okay? Seeds always slowly develop and grow, all right? But anyway, the devil comes in and he says, ah, you know, you won't die, okay? You can be like God. God's holding out on you, okay? It's all right. You can disobey God and you won't die. Now, we were, I was just talking to Deja about uh, some of the false doctrines, like once saved, always saved, uh, preacher of rapture. Uh, vir virtually all false doctrines allow the flesh to flourish. Tells you, you, you it's okay, you can sin, you won't die. Uh, you know, grace covers everything, you know, and before any difficult times happen down here on earth, you know, you'll, you'll be out your sunroof, boom, gone, you know. And, but those are all lies, okay? They are all lies, okay? So the truth is what sets us free. And God anoints his word to bring it to pass. It, it, it's the grace of God. That's the power of God. What's grace? Grace is when God gives you his ability all right, to replace your inability to be what he wants you to be and to do what he wants you to do. Because it's grace that does everything. For by grace are we saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, of your own power or strength, you know, not of works, lest anybody should boast. Okay, does it make sense? All right, so uh, laws are laws, physical laws, spiritual laws, but, um, uh, you know, what we need to do is ha understand how God operates so we can, uh, you know, apply those laws, okay? Uh, this book of the law shall not depart from thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein uh, day and night. Uh, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and have every success. Now, the, the God, the word of God is alive. You know, it's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, so when we study and, you know, look at the word of God, and if I'm born again and got the spirit of Christ in me, then that word starts to come alive, you know. And, and it's anointed to give me the power to be a doer of the word. Does that make sense? Okay. You know, <coughs> and that's the key. Because of myself, I can do nothing. But David said, I've hidden thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So how did he overcome sin? By getting into the word, because man does not live by bread alone, but in every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, that's your food. All right, and there's a food for the natural man and food for the spiritual man. You know, we eat three square meals a day to you know, make sure that the natural man's good, but if we just have one snack a week of spiritual food, then you, you know, when the devil comes around, he's gonna kick you around, okay? But if we get filled with the word of God, you're gonna kick him around, okay? Because the devil cannot make you do anything. See, this is the amazing thing, how God, God will not force you to serve him or follow him. He won't, because it's a choice. All right. Nor can the devil force you to do anything. All right. Be sober, be vigilant, for the devil is a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. Well, who determines whether he can or not? Me. If I listen to him and I, I act on what he says, you know, the temptations, I say, boy, that would that'd be great, you know. Lie, steal something, have, you know, whatever, illicit sex, drugs, I mean, you name it. You know, all he can do is tempt me, just like he did Eve. And But the devil will usually tell you that, don't forget, you can, you know, repent tomorrow. You know, it's okay. But once you plant that seed, uh oh, starts taking root. So the devil's words are seeds, just like God's words are seeds, okay? Every seed bears after its kind, all right? Now, uh, Jesus one time said to the Pharisees, as he was preaching and teaching, of course, Jesus said, the things that I say, there's, the words that I say are not my words. I only say what I hear the Father saying. In other words, if the Father's in me, what, you know, these aren't my words, okay? And these miracles that I do, it's not me, it's the Father in me that's doing, okay? So, <clears throat> but so, Jesus said my words are spirit and they are life to those that find them. And so, but when he'd speak, the Pharisees, they couldn't hear him. They just, it didn't, 
poof, didn't make any sense to them. They just like they had earplugs in or something. And Jesus said, why is it you can't hear me? He said, because you are of your father, the devil. Okay? Uh, and, you know, so there's only two spiritual fathers in the earth. The devil or God. That's it. That's it. When we're born the first time, we are born of Adam, who has that sin nature. All right? That's why Jesus said, you, you must be born again. Okay? The first man, Adam, which is where we're born the first time, was a corrupted seed, bad seed, because it had, it was, a, he had a sin nature. But when we're born again, we're born of the Word of God, which is a perfect, incorruptible seed. We have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the living and abiding Word of God. Does that make sense? Because the words, all words, of the devil or of God are seeds. They're spiritual seeds. You know, and, and so even though I live in this physical realm, those spiritual seeds, and I'm a spirit being, you know, if I accept those words and begin to vocalize them and believe them, then guess what? That seed is taking root, you know, and, and it's going to produce after its kind, okay? And that's what Jesus said, it, you know, to the Pharisees. He says, you can't hear me because you're of your father, the devil. You don't have the, whole, the spirit in you, the Holy Spirit, okay? And, and, uh, so, and he said, why is it you can't say anything good? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay? So um, this is, listen to this very carefully. Jesus said, therefore, every idle word that thou shalt speak, thou shalt give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words shalt thou be justified, and by thy words shalt thou be condemned. Okay? Literally, my whole life is determined, and at final judgment, it's all going to be based on what I say and what I believe. Okay? Does that make sense? Uh, and that's kind of spooky in a way. I just, ooh, you know, watch out. Because in James, it says that out of the same mouth could come both blessing and cursing. If I say what God says, and like Jesus, he said, my words are, you know, it's the Father that speaks through me. See, God watches over his word to perform it. So if I speak what God says, then the Spirit of God anoints that word to fulfill it. Does that make sense? Okay. You know, so, uh, you know, Jesus went around. He, he was teaching, preaching, and healing. That's what his ministry was, that teaching, preaching, and healing. It started with teaching, which is to, you know, cast out the seed, and it's entering the minds and hearts of the people out there. But remember, it's alive, you know, and faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So then, and preaching is just kind of pounding it home, Take, taking that same word and, and just uh, illustrating it from this direction and that direction and that direction until you got a very clear gasp, grasp of, of what the Word is saying, okay? And then he begins to heal, teaching, preaching, and healing. Now, why always in that order? Because first he's got to get, get the Word, get the seed in people, okay? Then the preaching, you see, puts the Spirit on that Word, and, and they, the people develop faith, okay? And then Jesus gets them to act on their faith, and boom, the power of God comes and fulfills it, okay? There's a town called Lystra in the book of Acts where the Bible says Paul was at Lystra. All right? And there at the, he ran into a guy that was lame from his mother's womb. Okay? Never walked. Okay? And the Bible says that Paul began to preach Jesus to him. All right? And the Bible says that the man was listening intently. Okay? All right? and, and at some point the Bible says Paul perceived that the man had faith to be healed. All right, he's probably, I don't know what he's doing, smiling, you know, nodding his head or whatever. But the word was producing something because it's alive, okay? And, and Paul understood how it works. He was planting that seed. Boy, he was pounding it home, you know. And then he perceives that the man has faith to be healed, which comes from the gospel, okay? And, and so he then, now the guy's still laying there, all right? But com Paul commands him to stand up, all right? 
In other words, act on your faith because faith without corresponding action is not true faith. True faith will produce something, okay? But it always requires me agreeing with it in some way, like saying it, doing it, something like that. And the man jumped up, instantly healed, okay? Because God watches over his word to perform it, okay? So that's the way the gospel works, okay? Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation for everybody that believes. But the amazing thing is the believing part is in the anointing. You know, so automatically, as Paul was preaching that word, anointed by the Holy Spirit, every seed bears after its kind, you know, it produced in, in this man faith, you know. And then, but, he, but Paul understood, man, you got to act on your faith. Jump up. You know, if he didn't command the guy to stand up and he just walked off and said, well, nice to meet you, sir. Well, then, you know, the Bible says he had faith to be healed. If Paul walked off and the guy said, man, that was a great sermon, he'd go home, he'd just still crippled, okay? Because we got to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Does that make sense? Because that's, man, that's, that's when God moves, all right? Um, anyway, I'm kind of going off track here a little bit, but uh, the, the point being that the, both the devil and God work through words. All words carry an anointing dependent upon their source, okay? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, what's, what is the heart? The heart is the combination of the soul, okay, which is your mind and your will and your emotions, uh, your, uh, say, we'll say, um, what you can see in your mind, okay? Um, and, and the, so it's the combination of the soul, and the spirit, okay? If you remember the tabernacle in the wilderness, we are tabernacles. The Bible says uh, you, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. That, you know, the Holy Spirit, God dwells in us, okay? And there's three parts to me, spirit, soul, and body, okay? The spirit, um, remember, if we're not born again, we have a corruptible seed or spirit in our in our. Um, holy place, okay, the holy of holies, okay, it's been corrupted, all right, so, but when we get born again, the, the spirit of Christ is conceived in me, in my spirit, the Bible says the spirit himself bears witness within my spirit that I'm a child of God, so now all of a sudden, instantly, okay, I become righteous before God, okay, all right, so, but, um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, if I've got a corrupt spirit in my heart, then I cannot say anything but corrupt things, okay? That's all I can say. You know, like Jesus said to the Pharisees, why is it you can't say anything good? Because you're of your father, the devil. You don't have God in you, all right? Does this make sense? Okay, but once Christ is in me, who is the word, Okay, he, he is the word, okay? Now, and, and so now when I look at the word and say the word, confess the word, pray the word, automatically the spirit of God in me anoints it so that it has power, okay? The Bible says uh, all words, of, no word of God shall be void of power. None, none of them, all right? Because Remember the, this scripture says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all of the host of them by the breath. What's the breath? That's the spirit. That's the Holy Ghost. Okay, when Adam, God created Adam, what did he do? He took a pile of dirt, molded it together, and blew into him the breath of life. That's the spirit. Okay, boom, and he became a living soul. Okay, so it's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Okay. Is all of this making sense? Okay. So, you know, if we can learn the, the, the laws and understand that the devil can take those laws and twist them around and use them against me. Okay. So, um, in my imagination, where did I get my imagination? From God. Okay. The Bible says God sees the end before the beginning. Now, how does he do that? You know, because he has an imagination. He, he knows in advance what he wants to accomplish, okay, whatever it is. He sees it, 
and then he exercises something called faith. Okay, so uh, we're made in God's image. You know, what I come up with in my mind, in my imagination, uh, and then I begin to confess it, declare it, act on it, then it will come to pass, okay? Where good or evil, good or evil, okay? Uh, let's see, there's a saying I, I kind of like. It's uh, anything that the mind of man can conceive and believe he can achieve. Boy, that's powerful. You know, we've talked about Nimrod. You know, Nimrod was an evil man, all right? But the Bible says he accomplished great things, built this Tower of Babel, built cities, had thousands of people following him. He was the king of this, you know, kingdom on earth at that time, okay? And, and remember, God came down to see what was going on. Remember that? And God said there is absolutely no limit to what this guy can accomplish. No limit, okay? And so what was, what God decided to do what? How was he going to stop this? He scrambled the languages. Okay? Because the power is in the spoken word. And when he's under the authority of demonic spirits and fallen angels, and he receives the thoughts and plans of the devil and then confesses and acts on him, then the anointing comes from the dark side to fulfill the devil's plan in the earth. Do you get that? So just like, you know, God works through people whose hearts are yielded to him. You know, and our will then becomes God's will. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? But if we listen to what the devil says, then pretty soon, you know, without realizing, we can be working and doing the work of the devil. And, and that's why James said, watch out what you say, you know, because, I, you know, if, if any man is, uh, how's that go, never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man and able to keep his whole body in check. He said that tongue is a restless evil. Nobody contain the tongue, okay? And he, and he compares the tongue to like the rudder on a ship, you know? The, the, the rudder's a small thing compared to the ship, but yet just twisting that rudder turns that whole big ship anywhere it wants to go. Same thing with the bits in the mouth of a horse, you know? Uh, I can turn that horse, big old horse, you know? A whole lot bigger than me, but I can make it go wherever, wherever I want. And he said, that's what the tongue is like, okay? That's what determines, remember, this is all about words. Every idle word that thou shalt speak, you're going to give account thereof. Because your words determine who you are, what you're going to be, how you're affecting everybody around you. You know, words are everything. Okay? Make sense? So God works. He puts his word in me to accomplish his will. But the devil works overtime. You know, trying to get in my mind to get me to, for fear, uncertainty, doubt, confessions of sickness, death, you know. Everybody in my family gets cancer. I get the flu every year. You know, I'll never be able to do that. Did you know there's only two kinds of people in the world, in the earth? Those that say, I can, and those that say, I can't. Now, they're always both right. They're both right. Because they literally decree the outcome in advance. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I can. Because it's not me, it's him in me. Okay? And, and you understand what I'm saying? And so um, watch out what you say. Because it determines. You know, watch out what you think. Because it determines what you say. Watch out what you say because it determines what you do. And watch out for the things you do because they determine your character and your character will determine your destiny. Does that make sense? All right, it's true, okay? So, uh, you know, James says, consider how great a forest could be set on fire by a small little spark, okay? And he said, so also the tongue is a little part of the body, but it can, literally it says that a man's whole life could be set on fire by the tongue. 
and the tongue itself is set on fire by hell. Okay? Wow. But see? And so, words. Man, words are everything. Okay? So, uh, that's why I need to get my whole being full of the Word of God. So that if some lie or deception comes in from the devil, you know, I can compare it to the truth and instantly recognize, well, that's, that's not God, okay? Uh, is this, you know, so I can, this, this is so important. The entrance of thy word giveth light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway, okay? Uh, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights in whom there is no darkness or shadow of turning. The kingdom of light, okay, comes from the word of light. You know, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn that shines ever more brightly under the full light of day. You know, you get, as you're growing in your faith, things get brighter. You get stronger as you feed on the word, okay? You're, you're strengthening the spirit man. Does that make sense? But it says, but the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They don't even know what makes them stumble. Okay? God's word is light. The devil's word is darkness. Uh, you know, and that's because those are laws. There are laws. Okay? So, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I started getting some of this, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know. I'm starting to think about all the things I've said wrong or whatever. All right? Now, he, here's what's important. Literally, curses can come out of your mouth. But thank God for repentance. Oh, my gosh. You know? Uh, remember when Balaam was trying to curse the Israelites, okay? There's a king called Balak of the Moabites, I think, or something like that. And he was paying Balaam to, to curse these people of Israel because he was trying to go to war with them, and every single time God intervened and beat the daylights out of him, you know? So he thought, well, if I could just curse them, you know? So Balaam was a prophet for hire, okay? And, and Balaam would open his mouth and get ready to speak a curse, but what happened? Every time he tried to say a curse, out came a blessing. You know, and he said, well, I cannot curse what God has blessed. Amen. All right. Now, guess what? That's true for you, too. You know, the, the, you're kind of like got the shield of faith on, which quenches all the fiery darts of the evil one. What are the fiery darts of the evil one? And what's the helmet of salvation? That means when the devil throws words at you designed to hurt you, to harm you, to get you to think them and say them, decree them, declare them, believe them, you've got, some, you've got the full armor of God on and he can't get to you. But you've got the sword of the Spirit, which is the opposite. Okay, that's the word of God. So the way you fight back is to say what God says. Okay, and, and so this is a war of words. Literally, I mean, this whole thing down here is a war of words. It's a war of words. You know? And I don't know, man. That, that's a, an important revelation to understand. This, um, all right. Now, um, okay. Revelation 12, 11 says, and they, talking about Christians, overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Now, the, the Greek there is rhema which means it's the Spirit-inspired Word. It's anointed by the Spirit of God. So it's a sharp two-edged sword. Remember we talked about, you know, this helmet of, I'm sorry, this full armor of God that we wear, you know, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, and our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Remember that? But if you go back, the double-edged sword, okay, edge, what's an edge? If you look in the Hebrew, the word for edge means a mouth. Your mouth is the way you wield your sword is to say what God says. That's the sword of the Spirit. And, you know, if, if I am obedient to God, keeping, you know, living in the light, if I walk in the light, is He in the light? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. And when I speak that word of God, see, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Okay? That means the old man. Because the old man is where the devil works. The, the, the devil only has access to the flesh. So every time 
you're tempted, it's always, you know, the, the new man won't respond, okay? It's only the flesh that does. But see, the minute we sense the flesh responding, what do you do? You get your hammer out and, you know, pound it over the head. Don't let the flesh live, okay? That's the nature of the, the, the cross. If we want to be a disciple of Christ, we have to take our, take up our cross daily and follow him. Make sense? It's the flesh that goes on the cross. What did Paul say? You know, he said, I beat my body and I make it my slave. Lest after preaching to others, I myself would be the castaway. Now here's Paul, man. He wrote half the New Testament. All right? But he said himself, you know, if I start acting in the flesh, listening to the devil, and begin doing what the flesh wants to do after being tempted by the devil, I myself could be a castaway, become apostate, fall away from Christ, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, because this is a war. This is a war, all right? But Paul says it this way. He says we are in a race, a race. And he, he said in a race, there's only one that wins the prize, okay? And that we are to run this race looking unto Jesus, uh, uh, the author and the finisher of our faith. Okay? Uh, now, what, who's in the race? It says, you know, there's just two. Only one's going to win. Okay? Well, who, who, who's racing? You know, it's your old man and the new man. All right? That's the flesh and the spirit of life. Okay? Christ in you. Now, uh, if whoever I, who's going to win the race? You know, whoever I feed, put it that way. Whoever I feed is going to win the race. If I sow to the flesh, I will reap corruption. If I sow to the spirit, I will reap life, okay? And, and so, um, you know, again, these are, this is, these are rules. These are, these are laws. And if we learn how to, to operate within these laws, man, I, um, I, I will win every single time, every time. Because, you know, the law, I mean, I, Christ has already beaten the devil, okay? You know, and, I mean, completely. He's, he's powerless. He might roar, but he can't bite unless I let him, okay? And, and so, um, but God has given me all the tools necessary to, to win that race, to win that race. There, there's things I don't do this, but do that, okay? And, and remember Deuteronomy 28 gives all these laws and things like that in the Old Testament. And, and God says, you know, Moses said, he said, I call heaven and earth as a witness before you this day that I place before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Now choose life, okay? Now, the way we choose life is to obey God, God's commandments. And we, you know, sometimes just saying that sounds like, boy, that'd be hard. No, he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, so if I feel like, man, I'm just really struggling to try to, you know, then I'm not, I'm trying to do it myself. Okay? Let's talk about sanctification. What, what is sanctification? May God himself... The God of peace sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, sanctification is to clean you up. Okay, uh, to wash all the dirt off and inside and out and backwards. You know, to because you know your spirit, soul, and body. Okay, may God Himself, not not somebody else, not me. May God Himself sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It starts in the spirit when I get born again. And, and here's an interesting scripture. Now, I'm going to say this too also. The Bible says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you completely. Okay, Because, you know, if, if I'm walking in the light, I am going to have the peace of God that passes all understanding. Okay? The... Does this make sense? Okay. So but, so, but it begins in my spirit. When I'm born of the spirit, Christ is conceived in me. Now here in 1 John, there's a scripture that says, He that is born of God 
does not sin. He cannot sin, okay, because God's seed indwells him. Now, boy, that used to confuse me, you know. I just, I couldn't, you know. I thought I was born again. I'd look in the mirror and I still mess up and do things wrong. And I'm thinking, you know, if I'm born again, I, maybe I'm supposed to be perfect, you know. No. Do you know what that means? The seed, you know, he that is born of God does not sin. You know, that's not me. That's Christ in me, okay? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, all right? So once I have Christ in me, that part of me, I still got, there's the new man, that's Christ. He's in me now. But the old man is still there. But now I've got the power through Christ to crucify him. Does that make sense? Every time the, the flesh rises up and wants to do something because it's tempted by the devil, the Bible says it's the grace of God that empowers me to say no to sin. I don't have to do it, you know. The devil might seek to see if he can devour me, but, you know, I pull out the sword of the Spirit, and I hate to say it, kick his butts, you know. All right, so, uh, because I already had the tools necessary to win. Does that make sense? Okay. So sanctification. The Bible says uh, Jesus is made unto us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Okay. Wisdom from God is the revelation that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I can't figure that out myself. It has to be like Peter said, you know, or Jesus said to Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because that revelation, it, it, you know, came from the Father. Okay? Now, that, that's the wisdom part. That for when the Holy Ghost reveals to me that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay? But then I have to act on it. And I confess Him as Lord. And believe it in my heart. All right? Then the Holy Ghost, bang, conceives the life of his son in me. The word comes to life. Does that make sense? All right. But remember, you know, he's made unto me wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So the first thing I get to start the journey is that wisdom, the revelation that he's the Christ. That's him. But I don't have it because it's, you know, it's not a second hand. It's firsthand because the Father himself gives me that revelation. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, then I'm instantly, once I confess with my mouth, believe in my heart, and I decree he is my Lord, okay, that God, boop, you know, conceives Christ in me. All right? The anchor for my soul. Okay? But then I'm instantly given a free gift of righteousness. All right? Now all of a sudden I feel at peace being in the presence of God. I don't feel condemnation. But if I am, you know, do feel condemnation, I, you know, or I'll just say conviction, okay? Condemnation and shame and nakedness always come from the devil. That's why the devil is all, tempts us. He will tempt you and tempt you and tempt you to sin. Because the minute you do, the anointing, it's like sticking a nail in a tire. Okay? And, and you grieve the Holy Ghost. Okay? And faith goes out the window. And all of a sudden, oh, you feel like Adam and Eve did when they sinned, naked and afraid. And what do you do? You run from God. What we need to do is run to God. All right? In 1 John, it says, you know, I write these things unto you, my children, that you do not sin. But if we sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then I come back in fellowship. It's kind of at home. You know, if there's a spat between some people at home, nobody feels right until there's repentance and forgiveness. Repentance and forgiveness. You know, and then that fellowship can be restored. The same thing is true for God, okay? Same thing is true for God, okay? So righteousness is the right standing before God, okay? Because he bore my sins, and it makes me at peace with him. Make sense? 
then comes sanctification, okay? What is sanctification? That's to save my soul. The first salvation is of the spirit of man, when I get a new spirit, okay? But then as he continues to work in me to crucify my flesh, eventually the goal is to crucify the flesh. And that's what Paul was talking about when he said, it's no longer I that live. I have been crucified with Christ, all right? And this life that I now live in faith, I just live by faith in the Son of God. So just like Jesus had said after he was tempted and tempted and tempted by the devil and by the power and grace of the Holy Spirit in him, he always said, nope, nope. And he'd quote the word of God and, you know, stab the devil a few times in the word. And, and, but he never sinned. He was tempted in every which way as we are and yet without sin, okay? That's the way he was sanctified, okay? It, he was born through Mary, Okay, and therefore had the sin nature in him just like we do. But now, but with the Holy Ghost inside of him, the devil could tempt and tempt and tempt, you know, and, and at some point Jesus said, the devil, Satan cometh, but find nothing in me. Because he resisted the devil enough to die, the flesh was dead. Now he was the sinless lamb and qualified now to die on the cross to take away the sins of mankind. All right? All right, now, so, but you and I, we have the power, once we get born again, we can say no to sin, keep doing it, keep doing it, and that's called sanctification, okay? Now, sanctification, we all, we think, so, many, so much of us, and I did for many, many years, thought, well, sanctification is something you just keep working, you get up early, you say your prayers, you do this, you, oh my God, this is hard work, you know? Uh, to try to be sanctified. Because we wrongly think that I'm supposed to do it. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? So, consequently, Jesus said, you know, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, you know, if, if I'm struggling, you know, this is... So, the result of that is, see, a lot of doctrines of men come from experience. All right? So... The Bible says, be holy as I am holy. But a lot of people have on their own, by their own flesh or strength, tried to be holy, and they fail. And again, and again. So they come up with a doctrine. It's impossible to be holy in this life. Nobody can quit sinning. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Well, those are false doctrines. Okay? And it simply means I don't believe God. All right? So let me explain something. Sin, a sanctification is not something achieved. It is simply received. Because the Bible says that Jesus, by one sacrifice, sanctified us forever. It's past tense. I'm already sanctified. But I, I had to bring it into manifestation. I have to believe it. Because everything comes by faith. Everything. Does this make sense? It's, it's not up to me. I mean, it, in a sense it is. I have to cooperate with God, but it's the Spirit of God that cleanses me, washes me. You know, uh, the, you know, in the Old Testament, type and shadow of the tabernacle, which is who we are, we are the tabernacle of God, okay? And, and there are three parts to that. There's the Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, and the, uh, the court, okay? In the court, there was a thing called the brazen laver, laver, okay, which you ever go to the lavatory to wash your hands, maybe use lava soap or something, you know. It means to kind of wash yourself up with that water. Well, um, what's interesting is when Moses was going to make all those parts of the tabernacle, he told the women to all bring their mirrors, mirrors, okay. And the, the mirrors are made of brass, you know, and they polish them up and so they could see themselves in their mirrors, you know. And, and so uh, then Moses melted that stuff down and cast the brazen lava, which is basically uh, it's also called the brazen or brass sea or something like that. It represents the word of God, okay? The, the water. We're washed by the water of the word, you know. So, uh, you know, after we sacrifice our lamb at the brazen altar, then you got blood in your hands, okay? But so you go up there and you wash the blood off, um, you know, at the brazen lava. 
But why is that thing made out of mirrors, okay? Because when you look down in a, a pool of water, you can see yourself, okay? Now, there's two kinds of mirrors. Natural mirrors, spiritual mirrors. You know, if I'd ask a question, who are you? Who are you? Well, you could walk into the bathroom and you look in the mirror, well, that, that's me. You know, but that's looking at yourself in the natural. And remembering all the bad things you did, and all the failures and all that kind of stuff. But see, that guy's dead. We have to believe what, the God, what God says. You know, when I got water baptized, went down into that water, the old man died. And when I came up on the other side, that's now a resurrection into a new life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. So, you know, if I want to know who I am, God calls the Bible a mirror. That's what that brazen altar represents. It's the Word of God. If I want to find out who I am, i got to look it up here. Let me see. Let me find out who I am. Oh, man, I'm more than a conqueror through him who loves me. Oh, man, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. All right, look here. Oh, oh my goodness. You know, sin does not have dominion over me, for I am not under the law, but under grace. All right? And, oh, my goodness, by Jesus' stripes, I was healed. Okay? You see what I'm saying? Who are you? All right? Well, I am whatever God says I am. Not what I look like in the mirror. Okay? God is who he says he is. All right? And he will do what he says he's going to do. I am who God says I am. And I can do whatever God says I can do. And if he says, you know, I can defeat the devil every time. All right? But it has to be at a spiritual level. If the devil can engage me in my mind with fear, doubt, uncertainty, then guess what? And if I accept those lies, then he's going to beat me. He's going to whip me. Okay? He's going to remind me. Remember what you did? You know, a week ago when you lied about something or whatever else like that. Remember? And, and so what happens when we sin? Like I said, faith goes out the window. You know, we grieve the Holy Ghost. So we need to keep short accounts with God. And, you know, good thing probably every day, just get on our knees and say, Lord, if there's anything that, you, that you're displeased with, Lord, forget, show it to me, you know, and give me the grace to not do it again. I love this guy, Brother Lawrence, okay? He wrote a, a book, or actually he didn't write it, but somebody else wrote it for him. But this is a man who took this verse, um, thou shalt keep in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Well, this is a guy back in the, I'm going to say 1400s or something like that. He decided, well, by golly, you know, he, he worked and all these kind of things, but he just decided that I'm going to keep my mind focused on God. All right, and, and so every time he started wondering, thinking about this or that, and you know how minds are, you're, you know, you start thinking about everything. But, you know, he just learned to discipline himself to put God as his focus. And it says, thou shalt keep in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Well, he, yeah, I'm telling you what, he became so anointed with the Holy Spirit just by practicing, he was practicing the presence of God. That's the name of this little booklet, okay? And, and people came from miles around to learn what, because the words that he spoke, you know, it's like when Jesus spoke, they, they, they marveled at the gracious words that came out of his mouth because he had the wisdom of God in him, okay? But here's, here's the point of what I'm saying. He still sometimes messed up, failed, something like that. But you know what he did? He, he didn't let the devil's conviction or con, I'll say condemnation, or shame come on him. He immediately confessed it to God, and this is what he said. God, if you don't change me, I'm going to do that again. I mean, that hit me like a brick wall. Wow. It's, God is the sanctifier, not me. 
Because sanctification is something simply received by faith, not achieved by works. All right? And so uh, all of the things of God are by grace and by grace alone, grace and faith. Okay? All right? Now, um, you know, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption are the salvation of the spirit, then the soul, then the body. So redemption is the salvation of the body. That's at the last trumpet when, boom, the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise and we who are alive at his coming shall be changed in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the mortality or shall put on immortality it, and I'll be caught up to be together with him forever. You see what I'm saying? So salvation begins in the spirit, then progresses through the soul, and then finally ends in the body. Okay, make sense? All right, all right. So, um, all right. Now, there's a whole lot of meat and potatoes in here. I'll tell you what. Okay, so um, look, you know, study the handout and uh, maybe listen to the tape a few times. All right. So, so, um, so basically, you know, the Bible says just. He said, my thoughts and my ways are not your ways or your thoughts. You know, he's up in heaven. Just as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts above your ways and your thoughts. All right? So now, God did not say that to say, too bad down there, you know. No, he's inviting us up, you see, to begin to see things as he sees them. Because I am who he says I am. All right? So he said, how does he, what's he do? Just as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and waters the earth and gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return to me void with, without accomplishing that for which I said, okay, I sent it for, okay? So when the word comes out of God's mouth, remember, by the word of the Lord with the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth, when he says something, it's a rhema. It's already anointed to produce. All I, what I need to do is receive it, believe it, say it, you see. But you know what he said? When that rain and the snow come down, it's just like that word. But you know what he said? It's seed for the sower. And then it will become bread for the eater. Now guess what? Just like God... His ways are higher than my ways and understanding or thoughts or whatever. You know what? The devil does the same thing. There's the kingdom of darkness. And guess what he does? Just like the rain and the snow come down from heaven, he sends down his word. And it's got an anointing on it. It's a lie. But remember, this is all a war of words. And I've got this helmet of salvation that protects my mind from, you know, the devil trying to give me some things like he told Eve. Oh, you can sin. You won't die. All right? But that was a, boy, that was a deadly seed, wasn't it? Okay? That was a deadly seed. All right? So, the, out of nowhere, things can come from the devil. Now, let me just say this. False doctrines... Um, I, I, I've used the term rat food to describe it because rat food is about 99%, I'm sorry, rat poison, okay, is what I want to say. False doctrines are like rat poison. Now, rat poison is about 99% good old rat food, all right? And that's why the rats go get it, all right? But all, just 1% poison will kill the rat. And that's the nature of the devil's words. The devil said some of the things that God said. It's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat it, you'll understand, you'll have the knowledge of good and evil. You know, but he twists it just enough to say, but you won't die. All right, and, th and that's the nature of false teaching, false doctrines. Usually there's some truth in there that, boy, that sounds pretty good. That sounds good. But watch out that no one deceives you. Many shall come in my name saying, I'm anointed, I'm Christ, and shall deceive many. All right? Because if it's a false doctrine, the Bible calls them sometimes doctrines of demons. All words have a source and anointing. All of them. 
if it comes from God and it accurately reflects the Word of God, then it's anointed by God's Word. But, you know, if it comes from the devil and it's a false doctrine, false teaching or something like that, guess what? There's always a spirit behind it. All right? That's why, the Bible, you know, was it Timothy or somebody? Paul, Paul said, uh, in the end times, people will be, they'll look for tickling ears, somebody that can teach them what they want to hear. Okay? And that usually has to do with uh, the flesh. It's all right. You, you know, you can uh, live in the flesh and it'll be okay. You're, you'll be forgiven or whatever. But he calls them, you know, doctrines of demons. There's a source that, you know, the devil can come in and give you a lie. And if I accept it, then guess what? The, the, the demon brings his sleeping bag and just makes house up here. Okay? And that's what we call a stronghold. A stronghold. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Okay? Right there is the battleground. Right there. Boom, boom. You know, and God's putting his word. The TV's putting in its stuff. You know, you're, you know, watch out. You're, you know, people that hang around bad people end up adopting things because things are contagious, you know. But, um, we have to guard this. You ever, you know, if you had a garden, remember, what, what are you made of? Dirt, all right? The dirt is good to grow seeds. Now, there's good seeds and there's bad seeds, okay? And, and that's the parable of the tares and the wheat, okay? When one of the parables was, it, uh, the Bible says that uh, there's this man who owned this land and he said he put good seeds. He sowed good seed in the field. But at night... An enemy came and threw out uh, seeds for weeds. And they started to grow up and come up. The servants came out and said, Lord, didn't you put good seed in your field? Where, where are these bad? Where's this weeds come from? And he said, an enemy hath done this. Okay? And they said, well, should we just go out and yank the weeds? No, let them just grow together until the time of the harvest. Now, the Bible tells us that as time goes on and we get into the end times, evil will wax worse and worse. And the righteous will become brighter and brighter, okay? Now, you know, normally when a weed and a wheat come up, they both look the same when they're these little blades, you know, that come up. You can't tell which is which, right? You got to wait till it starts bearing fruit. Then it's pretty easy to tell. By their fruit ye shall know them. So, you know, Jesus told his disciples, you know, when it's time for the harvest, go in and first gather all of the weeds, put them into bundles, and we'll throw them in the fire, all right? And then, then, all right, gather my wheat and bring it in the barn. And he, here's what's interesting. He said, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of God. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn that shines ever more brightly under the full light of day, Okay. Malachi says, when the Son of Man, S-U-N, when the Son of Righteousness comes, he will come with healing in his wings. You know, we are in a time when, you know, the devil's people, the weeds, I'm telling you, this nation has been so corrupted, that I promise you, they're going to be gathered together into bundles and thrown into the fire. Well, however that ends up, uh, you know, whether they go to jail, whether they're, you know, hung or whatever. But I'm telling you, the wickedness, unbeknownst to most of us, is beyond imagination. But God is going to deal with it. All right? So I'm about out of time. Um, let me say a prayer. We just sowed a whole bunch of seeds in you guys, all right? And me, you know, so... We're going to pray for that anointing of the Father, all right? Father God, I just thank you that your word does not go forth void. It always accomplishes that for which you sent it, Lord. It's anointed from above, Lord. And the promise is that in Isaiah 55, I'm going to flip to this and read it real quick. 
But when, when that seed, here's what it says, my word will not go forth from my mouth except it will prosper in the things for which I sent it. Now here's the next. And you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace and the mountains and the hills shall break, it, break into song before you. And all of the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall never be cut off. You know what that means? It means the curse is gone. The curse is gone. He's going to wipe away every tear and welcome us into the kingdom, eternal kingdom of the Father. All right? Father, I ask you to just anoint all of this word, Father, that's gone forth. These are your words, Lord. And they will produce after their kind, Father. Give us the strength and the power, the anointing, Father, to be doers of the word, Father. And uh, you will accomplish that for which you sent your word. We thank you, Lord. And it removes the curse in so many ways from our lives. And Father, just teach us to, be, uh, to, to demonstrate this to others. Father, and to tell others about the good news in Jesus' name. Amen.